Hi, I'm Colin Dardis. I'm a local poet and I run the Purely Poetry Open Mic Night at the Crescent Arts Centre. I think I first came across Bukowski with his novels, particularly Post Office. Um, I think I had read about it online somewhere and I read that he had done it in a mad frenzy of like three drunken weeks. And I, that sounds amazing. I want to read a novel that was been written in three weeks, so it's just been blasted out there. Uh, I can't remember what age I was, but I loved the novel, and it really encouraged me just to check out more of his work. Uh, if you're Bukowski version, then you're missing out on quite a bit. You're, uh, I admire your innocence and your naivety and your sweetness, but it's going to be corrupted at some stage, so it might as well be by Bukowski. I'm open to a lot of influences, some quite serious and some a bit experimental. Bukowski allowed me to find a side of my writing through, through poetry in particular that was kind of more relaxed and conversational, that addressed the reader directly rather than trying to talk through kind of obscure images. What I try and do in my work is to find the universal elements uh, of life but told through individual experiences and I think Bukowski is really good in that so hopefully uh, at some extent try to replicate that. Very rewarding to be read, um, you can sit down and easily lose yourself in it but there are videos and recordings of Bukowski out there and just the kind of mad approach that he takes, um, if you see him reading it's obvious that He's just doing his thing and he doesn't, he doesn't care about the audience response. He just wants, to, he, he, all that matters is the words. And that's quite a, it's quite a different perspective for someone to come along to a reading and do that. Uh, it's as if the audience isn't there and the camera is, or the voice recorder is just sneaked in. And he's, he's like in the middle of, of the process of creation, so we definitely recommend it check that out and hopefully at the uh, tributes night we'll get a little sample of that through the live reads. He's, he was kind of a self-made man and I mean he, he wasn't formally educated, he wasn't trained, he didn't move in the right circles and he was very critical of poets that did. Um, he didn't pander him to one, he, wanted, he wasn't a sycophant. Um, he very much stood on the field of one. Um, so I think for any critical acclaim, you know, you need to press the flesh and you need to suck up a little bit. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately in this life, the words aren't enough. Uh, also, I think because of Bukowski's lifestyle and maybe some of the writings and views that he had, particularly on violence, has turned a lot of people away. It's also a tender, very fragile side to his humanity that comes across in his writing that can be quite ignored. People just know Bukowski as the kind of like the sensationalist, the complete drunk, the womanizer. I think if people explored his work more, they would find that there's a lot more to the man and to his writing. The Strong Man by Charles Bukowski. I went to see him there in that place in Echo Park after my shift at the post office. He was a huge bearded fellow and he sat in the chair like a booter. And he was my booter, my guru, my hero, my roar of light. Sometimes he wasn't kind, but it was always more than interesting. To come from the post office a slave to the explosion of light confounded me, but it was remarkable and delightful confusion. Thousands of books upon hundreds of subjects lay rotting in his cellar. To play chess with him was to be laughed off the board. To challenge him physically or mentally was useless. But he had the ability to listen to your persiflage patiently and then the ability to sum it up its weakness, its delusions in one sentence. I often wondered how he put up with my railings. He was kind after all. The nights lasted seven, eight hours. I had myself. He had himself. And a beautiful woman. 
who quietly smiled as you listened to us, who worked at a drawing board designing things. I never asked what, and she never said. The walls and the ceilings were pasted over with hundreds of odd legends, like the last words of a man in an electric chair, or gangsters on their deathbeds, or a murder's instructions to our children. Photos of Hitler, Acapo, Cheap Sitting Bull, Lucky Luciano. It was an endless honeycomb of strange faces and utterances. It was darkly refreshing. And at odd, rare times, even I was interesting. Then the Buddha would nod. He recorded everything on tape. Sometimes on another night he would play a tape back for me and then I would realise how pitiful, how cheap, how inept I sounded. He seldom did. At times I wondered why the world had not discovered him. He made no effort to be discovered. He had other visitors, always wild, original, refreshing folk. It was crazier than the sun burning up the sea. It was the bats of hair whirling around the room. That was deco decades ago, and he's still alive. He met a place when there was no place. A place to go when all was closing in, strangling, crushing, dehabilitating. When there was no sound, no voice, no sense. He lent his easy, saving, natural grace. I felt that I owed him one. I felt that I owed him many. But I can hear him now, that same voice, is when he sat so huge in that same chair. Nothing is old, Bukowski. You're finally wrong this time, John Thomas, you bastard. <laughs>